I'm so excited for today's program, which is supported by the Alumni Association, but as well by the Notre Dame family of wines, which is a collection of winemakers with all a Notre Dame touch. You will be sampling some of the wines from this group today. My background, if you're curious, is in mathematical biology. And probably you have guessed by looking at the combination of those two words that my field is interdisciplinary. I study complex biomedical problems in a field where experts from different disciplines, they must collaborate together to reach conclusions. This is one of the reasons I love today's subject. Before us, we're going to have growing and harvesting of raw materials, transitions from chemistry behind the fermentation, which then we can experience through our five senses. Enology, chemistry, and biology come together to make enjoying a fine wine of glass with our five senses. To further explore these relationships, with us today, we have two talented faculty members from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Please meet Ken Kuno, and we have then Alex Cantor. Thank you for being with us today. And the group wouldn't be complete without actually introducing another Dame alumni. Lou Luca. Lucas, thank you for being here. So he's a proud member of the class of 1963. Anybody from the class of 1963 here? Yeah. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> so Lou is, is the founder of Lucas and Lewin Vineyards, uh, 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 which is one of the California premier's wine grapefruit growers, and is a legendary pioneer of the California Central Coast wine region best known as an innovator and a master of utilizing a variety of growing practices and techniques, his vast knowledge and experience in, in the field spans over 60 years. Please join me on what you do. Thank you. Guys, it's gotta be, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be the best science class ever, no? <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you're going to give us good teaching scores, right? <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started. And will you have a few words to say before we begin? Well, uh, I, feel, I feel surrounded by science. <laughs> uh, for me, it's good to get back to Notre Dame. Uh, I haven't been able to come back to any time, so for the last... 60 years. Uh, it's hard to believe that I graduated from here 60 years ago. Uh, 17 years old. <laughs> 17 years old, never been out of California. I grew up in a vineyard and get accepted to Notre Dame. That's got to be a... Uh, got, out, got on a train in Bakersfield and made it to Chicago in 38 hours. <laughs> a, a friend of a some railroad people who represent some of my relatives hauling their grapes on the railroad sent a guy down to pick me up, took me to the circle, and I looked for information. <laughs> and uh, the rest is history. Um, before we get into, uh, I'm going to move over here. Uh, I got something I want to do before we get started. Uh, at the end, I know that we're going to talk about the Notre Dame family of wines. and. Uh, I've been participating in it since its beginning. Uh, it's been going now, I think, six or seven years. Um, fortunately, I've been selected uh, six out of seven years, if I remember correctly. Um, the guys from Napa can't believe that. <laughs> uh, I brought with me a bottle of wine, Notre Dame wine, that was selected two years ago. And I brought it because it talks about, it's named 2020 Walk on Wish Pinot Noir. And what was behind it was, I happened to be a walk-on in two sports at Notre Dame, and I had to prove to the world that I did earn a monogram. <laughs> now that I got the important part out of the way. <laughs> um, 
If you talk about wine, you talk about grapes. It starts with grapes. Uh, bad grapes usually don't make good wine. Um, I have all the respect for winemakers. Uh, I consider myself a winemaker. I went to the one-week course at uh, University of California at uh, Davis for a week, 30 years ago. But in the meantime, I was growing grapes and I had a, one of the great winemakers who was a winemaker for me for nine years, um, Daniel Gears. And then 16 years ago, I hired a young lady who had had a couple years experience in Napa and she's now been with me 16 years. Uh, and she's been terrific. And I work closely with her. And one of the things that in our vineyard in the winery is the close relationship between the vineyard and the winery. I'm her assistant winemaker and I grow the grapes. And it's in the grapes. At the present time I grow 400 acres of grapes. I grow 29 varieties. Everybody says six is too many. I got, somehow I got out of the whatever they thought. Anyway, uh, it's not that I grow many. It, uh, each one I treat as an individual. Uh, I'm into trellising. Um, I'm doing things that most, most are getting away from doing. I do everything by hand. Uh, I'm not happy with machine harvesting. Oh, that when I was a large, at one time I was a very large grower when I first got started. Uh, and I, I wore out eight machines over a period of about 12 years. And I don't like machine harvested grapes. The machine, machine harvest harvests too many things. Bugs and mice droppings and a few other things that aren't so cool. Anyway, uh, but uh, that's today's world. Now we even have machines that want to prune the vines. But what they're finding out with that, that, the, that these machine pruners, the vine, and if, you're, and if you prune by contract, which is prune as fast as you can, you end up with vines at 30 years old, people are yanking out. My vines get good when they're 46. You know, it's, uh, it's the way you care for them. And, and, and then where you grow them. And what brought me to the central coast of California was Napa Valley was king. When you go back 60 years ago, Napa, Napa Valley was king. It's still king. But it was expensive and the area was limited. And so while I was working on the Central Coast, John Marco was down in Temecula, Southern California, and, uh, and a couple of families that were up in the Monterey area. We all had the idea that we could grow good grapes and not be in Napa. And so, and just like when I was selecting, helping select the wines for today, uh, there are a couple of Napa Sonoma wines, but there's also a Central Coast from Paso Robles, and there's also one from Monterey. I wish one of my wines were in here, but uh, this way I can, I, I can talk about somebody else. And the other thing is, in talking about somebody else, I'm not interested in degrading or saying anything derogatory about other people. But wine, wine speaks for itself. And the other thing is we all have different taste buds. And this is something we have to think about in tasting. Um, what tastes good to you may not taste good to me. So how do we judge that wine? And then um, these wines that we're going to go through, they express the region that they're from. We'll talk about that when we're tasting them. But it, the world of, it's, there's a world of wine. And it's amazing, uh, one of the perks, uh, you know, I describe my business as a non-profit, but the perks are good. <laughs> I was with some of my classmates who have been retired for 20 years, <laughs> recently, uh, or 15 years, or whatever it is, and you're still doing what, you know? Uh, but in the farming business, and, and, and Farming grapes is like farming anything else. Every year you push out everything you have and you hope it comes back. And uh, I, 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 recently I made a comment and it came back to haunt me a little bit. I said, you know, if I started over again, I'd sign a 50 year contract to bake even. <laughs> That's the way the ups and downs are. You know, the rainstorm, frosted. I've been, I've been frosted, rained on, 
boycotted. I've done just about everything. And uh, so, but back to wine. Wine is culture, wine is friendship. Wine is the reason we're here together today. Uh, you can travel the world of wine. That's the other thing. I have traveled the world of wine, whether it be Australia, Chile, Europe. I've studied the great vineyards of, in 74 and 75, I went two week, or five weeks, two summers. My goal was to study the 28 best vineyards in the world. I took soil tests, petiole analysis, some with permission, and some by accident. <laughs> I wanted to learn, is what, uh, and, and that's what um, that's what makes wine fun, and, and, and we have enjoyment with it. And uh, hope, let's, well, hopefully today we'll have some enjoyment. So, so Louis, how about we start out with the wines in front of us? Since you started talking about different kinds of grapes, we have a Cabernet, a Chardonnay, excuse me, and a Sauvignon Blanc. Maybe something about the grapes. All right, let's let's start with uh, Chardonnay. Uh, I would have said Sauvignon Blanc, but Sauvignon Blanc has a character of its own, and I think you would have a little residual effect on the next wine you taste it. So start with Chardonnay because it's a little softer, a little easier. Uh, when we talk about kings in the industry, uh, Paul Hobbs maybe went, well is one of the great winemakers in the world, and he has a he has a small operation in. in uh, Napa Valley, and I think he also has a situation going on in Armenia and maybe also in Argentina. He's a winemaker deluxe, and he's an artist with oak. And this Chardonnay is his, I would say his regular Chardonnay, and uh, you need to taste it. Um, on, with these wines, you want to play with them a little bit. Um, Before you, before you take that, put your nose in the glass and swirl around. Put your hand over the top, then swirl around. Okay? And it'll double up on the nose again. How'd that work? <laughs> So, so Louis, when, when you're tasting this wine, what do you experience? What are the notes that come across to you? The first one to this is I'd like another sip. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, kidding. I don't want to be too serious here. Um, brightness, elegance. Um, Oak, but not overwhelming. You know, it's, um, the other thing with wine is you want to hold it in your mouth a little bit and, and feel the texture of the wine. I think that mouth feel is something that you, you need to learn about wine because you get into the, some of the reds, they bite a little bit, and, and then some of them get softer in your mouth and you get the real experience from holding it in your mouth a little bit and, and, and finding the texture of the wine. And then this one here to me has a little, it's a little tropical, a little bit tropical. Um, pleasant, uh, had an experience two nights ago uh, when I first tasted this wine. Some friends came in and I went and had dinner with them and they were drinking a Chardonnay and they said, well, what have you been doing? And I said, well, I've been drinking Paul Hobbs. <laughs> so they ordered a bottle of Paul Hobbs, and the difference was sub substantial difference. It, it, uh, I just, uh, when I was uh, tasting these, I took, I took notes on when I was tasting over there at the restaurant. And, uh, this is some of the things I said. Oak is there, but not overwhelming, and it holds flavor. Fine, but invigorating. Great in the mouth, elegant, smooth. And uh, my conclusion was that Paul Hobbs is the master of wood. <laughs> okay, L Louis, the fruit, the fruit, not to talk too much chemistry today, but the fruity notes that you've experienced, <laughs> those, those, those are esters, yes? 
I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> You're the scientist. <laughs> And then, and then uh, Louis, could you tell us a little bit more about the Sauvignon Blanc that's next to okay. it? And the other, the other thing, finishing up with Paul Hobbs, that's, it's an expression of the, the, the Napa Valley area. Uh, and Napa Valley, it can be war very warm, and, and you get in, as you go towards San Francisco, you get into Corneros, and that's where a lot of the Chardonnay comes from. But this one comes from a little, little warmer district than Corneros, where it's cool. That leads us into the next one, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. This one is grown in a cool region. And go ahead and play with it a little bit. And uh, what happens in the cool region with Sauvignon Blanc, have you ever had a, a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand? Grassy. I mean grassy. And uh, that's a sign that the region is a very cool region when you get the grassiness. And this one shows some grassiness, uh, but not overwhelming, not like, the, not like New Zealand. And uh, I was gonna look to see uh, what I, okay, I said grassy, complex, at times can be like candy, lasting taste, cool climate. And then the other thing we need to look at too is alcohol. I think that one of the things happening in the wine industry today, we're going too high in alcohol. The problem is we're not getting the grapes ripe at lower sugar levels. Uh, in Napa, it's, it's, uh, in some places, they actually take in Cabernets and uh, harvest them in like a 27, 28 sugar, which relates to like 16 alcohol. And then they make the wine, and then they bring in the machine and de-alcoholize the wine down. There's also a method in doing that. You don't do the whole lot. You take a small portion of the lot, and take a lot of the alcohol, and put a little bit back in, and it doesn't, doesn't disturb the wine too drastically. But they're not getting their grapes ripe enough uh, at lower levels. Recently, I bought a bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. I made a down payment first. <laughs> And uh, when I looked at the alcohol, I says, oh my goodness, 12 and a half alcohol. I've never seen a California Cabernet at 12 and a half alcohol. I mean, it starts usually at 14, 15. And then, of course, in Paso Robles, where I had a vineyard for 17 years, they're making some at 16. But again, the indicators is what happens with the grapes that you're growing. And and taking my tests and great vineyards and stuff. There are a couple components in the soil that really are critical. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to go, I, I have a great Cabernet, a Clone 6 Cabernet, that I'm, I'm able to get it right in at 14, 14 uh, sugar, or excuse me, alcohol. And then I, this past year, we had an unusual growing season. I'm working on one that could be between 12, 8, and 13, 2. And that's unheard of for California. But again, it, it goes back to the vineyard. The other thing, and everybody says to me, what do you see in a vineyard? And I said, after 50 years, I see what everybody else can't see. And that is that, just like one of the things that's been with me and why I have 12 different trellis systems and not the two regular, I have the two regular ones, but I have these other special for varieties. Leaf surface area to the sun, believe it or not, can change the way vines, grapes mature. I had an experience where I bought the neighbor next door. I was har harvesting more tons per acre of Sauvignon Blanc, this variety, and I was picking before him like three weeks. And he was picking his late, and his weren't quite as mature as mine. I bought the vineyard and today we pick them together. And that's just by going and changing the trellises. So um, there's a lot of work. And then some of these great places in France and, and around the world, really what happens, people discover a natural place to do things. And that's like some of those places in France. I went to Alsace where they have Gewürztraminer and, and uh, Riesling and 
There's two brands there, Hugel and Trimbach. I went up and took a soil test and sent it to my guy in California and he wrote me back. He said, if it were in California, we'd mine it and sell it to the grape growers. <laughs> That's how good the soil was for that particular. And, and his vines were so, they say, you know, to have good grapes, the vine has to starve and has to, uh, that's the last thing you want in a grapevine. I want a beautiful grapevine. <laughs> I want leaves functioning. I want action. I don't want to stress. In fact, if vines have viruses, I hate to say that, but vines have viruses. And if you stress them, you know what happens? The virus comes on stronger. I have, I have a situation where I, I uh, planted Wente clone Chardonnay, which is great little tiny bunches. And, and everybody says, it makes great Chardonnay. Well, I bought a vineyard, and it was Wente clone, and it's, it was an area where Chardonnay didn't belong, so I grafted it to Cabernet, and I put clean stock on the Wente clone stock, and I got the viruses from the Wente clone. I proved that the reason those bunches were small was virus. It, it, it's interesting how outside things, the soil, the sun, all the things that can influence what you're doing. Um, Louis, are, are there other winemaking practices that differ between, let's say, California and here in the States versus Europe? That's, I'll tell you, winemakers, you know, create, the, create they're so creative that they're, they're trying different things. Just like when you go to ferment, uh, one time we made the same Chardonnay with five different yeasts for the fermentation. We, we got five different wines. Blew me away. I said, can't be. And uh, then uh, temperature. The stainless steel tank is the greatest thing, invention for the wine business. Because it gave you a, a vessel, a clean vessel with a jacket around it to control temperature. So when, you, when, when you're fermenting this Sauvignon Blanc, what you do is you stick it in the tank dial it down, instead of being done in 10 days, it's done in 20 days or 30 days. And the longer you ferment, it's slow, slow, it low, it, it, a slower fermentation improves the esters and the character of the wine. And, and, and it also takes very good care of the wine. Louis, Alex and I teach this uh, wine, beer, and the spirits class here at Notre Dame. And uh, when we make our own beer and wine in the, the back alley of Stefan, <laughs> <laughs> We use kits, okay, so we're not as sophisticated, but how do you guys choose the, the yeast that you use? Well, it was simple. 30 years ago, we had one yeast. <laughs> Today, we have a catalog of yeast. We have one for every occasion. If you want to add this, you want to add that, they got one for every occasion. And it's the same way rootstocks in the vineyard. They have a rootstock for drought, one for phylloxera, one for nematodes, or one that does all of them. And, and, and you know what the moral story is? 80% of my vineyards are on their own roots. And that's a phylloxera danger. Everybody says, you're going to get it, you're going to get it. Uh, I try to keep the vines healthy. I learned one thing that uh, from my father and my uncles, keeping vines healthy, just keeping them healthy will prevent a lot of problems. And, and uh, Phylloxera comes from having, where you have vines, take out vines, plant vines back again, take them out, plant again, and after you've done it for a century or so, phylloxera usually finds its way in. And it's the, one, it's the thing that killed all the vines in Europe in the 1800s. And they took, they had to take, they had to use American rootstocks that were immune to it. And all those vines, when they were planted back, had resistant rootstocks. And so most people today, when they plant, use resistant rootstocks. For a commercial guy like myself that goes out to buy vines, you can buy a rooting, which is grown out one year and then cut back. It's dormant. And they sell for about $5 a piece. So if you're putting in 1,000 vines per acre, or 500 or 2,000, whatever, you can see you can get five or $10,000 involved just in the stock itself. That's not planting, not doing anything. Louis, um, you, you mentioned phylloxera. You must have lived through a lot of history. I heard that there's a judgment of Paris. Have, have folks heard about the judgment of Paris? No. Yes? Not everyone? Louis, could you remind folks? I mean, you lived through it. 
I lived through the judgment of Paris. <laughs> I didn't think I was that old. <laughs> the, the modern one. What? Uh, the, the modern one with uh, St Stephen Spurrier. Oh, that, I'm, I don't get into that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm immune to that. <laughs> okay. Um, but, again, there are places in the world where you know, grapes are planted, they're replanted, and, and then the other interesting thing about if you compare, if you're going to compare Europe to here, uh, their vines are smaller and more populated. Our vines are bigger, and so we're going smaller and they're becoming bigger. Some, we're getting closer to being similar. Uh, when I went to France and Germany and those places in, in uh, 74 and 75, when I left California, I had the Davis group come down. Uh, Davis is, you know, the hallmark of maybe viticulture and enology in the world. And they would come down and they would tour what I was doing. And I was labeled a misplaced table grape grower. Because I was doing all these things to the vines. Like leaf removal and, and uh, hedging and some of these things that, and shoot removal. Anyway, uh, when I went to Europe to see the great ones, they were doing it. So I, I said, that can't be all bad. And then when I came back, and then when Robert Mondavi did it, eight years later, it was called Canopy Management. And so today it's Canopy Management. But again, the vine it starts in the vineyard. And then if we really want to get involved in the vineyard, is grow good grapes and then try to pick when you're going to harvest them. Boy. It's archaic what we do. So. So we, the one thing we want to make sure we get to is these red wines in front of us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> we, have, we have lots of time to talk, but okay. we only have so much wine. All right. Um, so tell, us, tell so, us a little bit about the reds in front of us. You know, what happens is I talk from the vineyard aspect, and most people that go out and talk, talk from the wine react, winery aspect. But we have two reds here. <laughs> And one's a Pinot, one's a Cabernet. One is from Monterey County, and the other one is from Paso Robles. And they both express the regions that are from. Paso Robles can be very hot. Monterey. You win. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was supposed to do that. <laughs> anyway, um, what we have here is Pinot Noir has become the darling of the last 25, 30 years. And I hate to say it happened with a movie. And it happened in my backyard, this movie, sideways. In fact, our wine appeared in two, in two episodes. On his nightstand was a bottle of Arpino. And then when he got depressed and he went to the Hitching Post Winery to drink, he was drinking Arpino. So our wine's good for depression. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I gotta tell you why we didn't grow Pinot before the movie. We didn't grow, but very little. In fact, my first Pinot we made, we made uh, white wine out of it during the white wine boom. And I sold it to August Sebastiani and he made a wine called Eye of the Swan and it was a blush wine. And, and then I sold some to Corbel Champagne for champagne. Pinot's an a, a important ingredient in champagne. But what happens is Pinot is a very difficult variety to grow. It's temperamental. One year you can get a crop, next year not such a great crop. Uh, and, it, and it's just, de and it's delicate. It's, it's not the easiest wine to make. You can get browning in the color of, of your pinots when you're making wine. And so pinot was, it was resistant. And this movie comes along and wakes up the world, it kills Merlot. <laughs> California put out, took out over the next 10 or 15 years, 20,000 acres of Merlot. But you know what about that Merlot? It was grown in the wrong places to start with, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Merlot needs to be in cool weather. Again, 
the greatest, the greatest wine in the world is Petrus. 99% Merlot, 1% Cabernet Franc, and 20 or 30 thousand dollars a bottle. Okay, back to our wine. <laughs> uh, all right, have you tasted the Pinot? All right, I get my notes on the Pinot. Uh, I like the Pinot. It's Monterey County, uh, not an expensive Pinot. Uh, to me, it's ladylike. A little, I won't say feminine, but I'll say it's ladylike. Uh, I get a little cherry, and I get a little vanilla, and I think the oak that they use passes on a little vanilla. So I, uh, uh, for the price and the location, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice Pinot. Gives me a little excitement. I better have a something. Softness goes down easy. All right, next is the Cabernet. And I picked this because of a football player. <laughs> I had, I had 500 acres of passerelles for 17 years, and I grew Cabernet. And it's very hot. And when it's hot, one of the things I didn't talk about is sugar, acid, and pH. When I'm harvesting, I'm testing sugar, acid, and pH. And uh, it's hot in passerelles. You can have 110 day, 110 in some days. And what happens in the hot, the pH goes up, the acid goes down, and sometimes you even have to add acid to make things balance. So, it's, it's not a big, it's a nice, easy, everyday type of wine, this wine. Whereas if we compare it against the Pinot, the Pinot shows a little more class of the variety, specifically from where it's grown. And the other thing in Pinots, and now also in Cabernets, I don't know if, you, if you've, people have talked to you about clones. Within the variety, we have clones. In Europe, what is a clone? It's a specific that you take. Let's let's use Pinot as an example. You have a clone, and uh, the the French claim they have two thousand clones of Pinot, which means everybody has one. And what happens is, when you're a vineyard person, you find a vine that you think is a special vine every year. My father used to mark the best vines in his vineyard, so when he planted his next vineyard, he only took the wood from the best vines. And this is what happens with this cloning. Within the variety, people take specific vines, take them off to the side, and build up a population of them. And so, just like in Pinot, now, I, I grow 11 clones of Pinot. I grow three clones of, of uh, Cabernet. Uh, other varieties, there's a few different Syrahs around, but that's something that's only happened in the, oh, I say the modern era, the last 10 years, um, yes. or 20 maybe. But what happens, in the old days, you found a good vineyard, and if you, just like when I was going to, I was going to plant this vineyard in Santa Maria to start with. And I went to Dr. Gohina Davis, and he told me don't plant. He says, I'm going to come up with virus-free vines, okay? because everybody was concerned about viruses. So when, when, as a grower, you marked your good vines, and that's where you went for your wood. And Dr. Goheen, by heat treatment, and all that is to grow great grapes. It started with strawberry and rose. You can grow them as fast as you can in warmth, and it outgrows the virus, and that little piece up here is virus-free. Dr. Goheen gave me six buds virus-free, and in nine months, we made 400,000 vines out of them. That's a miracle. Or not really. He also gave me the two nurseries that would take that one bud and propagate it up and they'd make a mother block. And I got all these vines. And I'll tell you what it did for me. I made, it made the cover, I made the cover of, of uh, Wines and Vines magazine holding my potted vine. And it said, the miracle of Tepesque. And Tepesque was my vineyard. And I sold eight million cuttings of that, of those vines before I picked a grape. And that's how important not having viruses and vines is. 
So, Louis, um, a lot of us in the audience, a lot of us in the audience aren't going to get a chance to grow our own grapes or make our wine from them. Um, but most of us are going to have the chance to select a wine, to buy wine, and to enjoy it. Um, so what can you tell people in the audience about how to be a more informed or discriminating consumer? I should tell you to buy my wine. But <laughs> 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 my biggest problem is marketing. Um, but I, I think you have to venture out. Um, you know, uh, just like I, I'm the original wine for Kendall Jackson, they still have my vineyard producing that Kendall Jackson wine. And there are a lot of wineries around, uh, thousands. California, we now have thousands of wineries, a lot of small wineries. Uh, be, venture out, try different things. Uh, there's some, I'm, I don't know, how many of you have ever had Viognier? Viognier came over here 20 years ago. Randall Graham brought over, a friend of mine brought it over from Europe. And they made it wrong to start with. They switched around and improved on the way they make it. And it's becoming a darling of the industry right now, Viognier. And, and, and um, I, I'd say, don't be afraid to try a new region. You never know. They're trying to go rapes in Minnesota. University of Minnesota, believe it or not, has come out with some outstanding viticulture ideas. So, um, uh, I say, uh, don't just buy the label. You know, turn it around, read the back. Hopefully, they'll tell you something more than the, the nice blowing breezes off the Pacific Ocean. You know, but um, and then blends. I love blends. Uh, I like the co-ferment. Co-ferment. When I was in those great vineyards in Europe, most of them did not blend wine for a blend. They blend the grapes together and fermented them together, and you always get something better. I have, I have about five or six wines where I actually pick the grapes together and, 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 and do that and ferment them together. It, it, gives you, it gives you something special. I've been doing that now for, well, what happened, I went, I went to Europe and in these great vineyards, I even saw them planting a few different varieties in the same row. So when they picked, they picked and they didn't have to worry about going somewhere else to get the, to co-ferment. So, uh, but there's things like that out there. Some people are starting to do co-fermenting. Uh, and then new regions are popping up. And then there's good wine, wine magazines and stuff that can give you an insight to what's going on, you know. Hey, Louie, why, why don't we open up for questions? I'm sure folks out here have questions beyond just buying the wine. Oh, up here, so, please. One, one thing to say is there are microphones yes. uh, in the aisles here, and we need you to ask your question at a microphone so that the folks uh, who are watching the recording of this session. My question is, how do you evaluate the quality of the wine that you're selling? So l let me just repeat that. The question is, how do you value a vineyard? Well, if it's producing wine that you know or n and you know a lot about, or uh, that would be the, if it's an existing vineyard, I don't want to know how good the wines are. The other thing is that I would take somebody out to look at the vines and see what they're like and how they're trained and, uh, it, um, Buying vineyards, that, that's, it's, it's not easy because within a vineyard itself, you can, have all kinds, you can have all kinds of issues. But vines like Napa Valley today, grape vines are going for 300,000 an acre. Nobody can exist, that's, you, you, couldn't, you can't exist at that kind of a price. So people, the few people are buying are either highly involved or highly wealthy and uh, but uh, vines you know you know again I, when I look at the vineyard you know it's not wearing much clothes <laughs> it, it uh, 
you know, you're looking at age, you're looking at the quality of the wood on the vines, uh, how they're trained, the trellis system, what kind of irrigation. It's like now, drip irrigation is, the, you know, the, saves us about 60% in our water costs. Uh, whether you need frost protection, you need wind machines, you need sprinklers. I have all those things in some of my vineyards, sprinklers, wind machines. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, I just took over a vineyard next door to me for my neighbor whose health isn't good. I'm helping him out. And, and uh, the, the care the vineyard had before was lacking. So we've gone in and we've cleaned up some of the things. We, we went through when we removed shoots. If they left a wheat cane, wheat cane produces a lousy fruit and doesn't get ripe and takes too much energy away from it. We clean that up and, uh, you know, do things. Uh, and then, then there are not a lot of vineyards for sale. I don't know where, where you live, but there aren't too many. <laughs> I have some land to sell you. Next. <laughs> okay. We have a question over here. Yes. Hey, can this? Okay, perfect. Um, my question is focused on temperature control. So you had mentioned how um, sleeve stainless steel um, is great as a tool to help control the temperature as you ferment wine. Um, I've been to some wineries that use like natural temperature control where they just open up the doors at night, let it cool off, and they don't necessarily have air conditioning. Are there different benefits to use like that method versus more contemporary methods? You know, we try every possible way to watch our costs. And, um, you know, if we, can, if we can do without, just like we, we were, uh, give you an example, if we were in our winery, we, we have those sludge and some of the things that are left over from fermentations and stuff. And they wanted $800,000 for a new machine to clean it up. Well, we had closer to 8,000 than the 800,000. And so we figured a way to collect it ourselves. And we were, right now we take it to our own vineyard or some open property we have where we need to put a little acidity in the soil and we're spreading it out there and we're, we're, we're you know, we try to do things as natural and as economical as possible. Um, but back, back to uh, the other, you know, you, met, you mentioned one important thing when you said temperature. Sometimes I bring the fruit in and the fruit is 90 degrees. And then sometimes I bring the fruit in and when I start picking in the morning, it's the coldest. That's like everybody says, pick at night. You know, I can't work 24 hours a day, I'm too old. But uh, I don't pick at night. And I have neighbors that pick at night. I think it's dangerous to pick at night. Uh, at the same time, the grapes are coldest at the first thing in the morning. If you pick right after the sun goes downhill, they're the hottest they are. So, but you know, and it's spread over time. So temperature is a big thing. And then we have, uh, we can run them through a, a circular deal that will cool the juice down. But like if you want to ferment for 30 days, you want a constant temperature. You don't want it going up and down and around and, you know. Uh, and of course, barrel fermented, you're, unless you have a, a barrel room that's air conditioned, and we have that too. Uh, in most cases, we like to go at room, you know, room temperature. Uh, but the other thing is, these wines have to be monitored. The most important thing my winemaker does is to make clean wine. You got to start there. It has to, otherwise, it's, it'll spoil. You know, thank goodness we didn't get into sulfides. <laughs> okay. I have a wait, wait, wait. How do you spell VA, whatever that popular wine is? Go to France. <laughs> the question is, how do you spell Vignette? V-I-N-E-R. So, I, I had a question. You mentioned different regions, and uh, the Great Lakes has, has a lot of wineries. Niagara, Traverse City, and actually right across the border, Bering County, Michigan, I live there. We have about 25, 26 wineries and breweries. What does temperature and region do to the wines? I mean, 
you know, obviously we aren't as famous as Napa, Sonoma, California, but there's some good wines that are produced there. Absolutely. Um, I'm familiar with some of the stuff around Lake Erie. Okay. Um, uh, Dubonnet Cellars, there's a couple of them. I, I love, I love the, some of the wines coming out of the Finger Lakes. Uh, Michigan, I have a friend that, uh, that goes to the church in Solvang who has an uh, actual winery and vineyard in Michigan. Uh, those, those, are, those are good wines. They, they, should, they, they should be competitive with everybody else. Uh, I, you don't have to be in California or uh, France or whatever to grow grapes that make good wine. I, I, I'm a firm believer. Texas, Texas has spent more money trying to grow good grapes, but they, they got a temperature that's tough on them, really tough on them. Oh, in the back by saying that uh, he did not prompt me on this question. But anyway, Louis, what is your, you know, part of the drinking of wine is not before you even start drinking it, is you have the toast, you clink the glasses. What is your favorite toast? That, that is Mike Becker, my friend from 60 years ago. <laughs> You know, probably the best, the best toast I ever made was at my daughter's uh, wedding last summer. Uh, it's nice when you taste your daughter with your own champagne. Okay? And I said, you know, this is kind of from me in the vineyard to you. <laughs> and uh, it's something special. And. Uh, Hope you have some great vintages. <laughs> here's, here's my favorite one. Really, here's my favorite one. You know, whenever you clink the glasses, it's supposed to sound like a, you know, a nice sound. But if you clunk them, it's not very nice. So if you hold a glass like this, and it sounds like this, that's the church bells chasing evil spirits <laughs> We had, a, we had a question in the back. Yes, yes, ice wines fascinate me. In, in my venture, that was two years in Europe, I went to the Tsar River in Germany to Dr. Fischer, who makes the greatest ice wine in the world, and sat and had lunch with him and tasted his wine. And all I can say about ice wines, have you ever had a popsicle? <laughs> have you ever sucked the juice out of a popsicle? That's ice wine. <laughs> and the reason I say that, it is because I've played around with it, but we've put ours in a cooler, a cooler and freeze them because the real ice wine is frozen on the vine. You pick it frozen and bring it in. And there's only a few places in the world that are capable of doing that. But we, we froze it, stuck it in the press, pressed it, and you get a press with ice in it. And you get this concentrated juice that comes out of the bottom. One of my specialties is late harvest wines. I make seven or eight different late harvest wines. Again, I had Myron Nightingale from Barringer, the greatest guy in California history for, for uh, late harvest wines. And he was my mentor for five years when I had a Behringer contract. And I learned all about the late harvest wines. They're fascinating. We let the grapes overripe. We get this noble rot. They turn rotten. But it's noble. It's Botrytis scenario. Whereas black rot and vinegar rot, you have to throw away. This other one, it's almost like a honey character. Then you get these marvelous tasting concentrated wines. I love that kind of stuff. At this point, oh, just one quick question, please. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, let me just repeat those back for the, the sake of people in the back and people listening uh, in the future of the recording. Uh, the first question was, what is climate change going to do to our vineyards and, and to the wine industry in general? And the second is, how do you know when to call it quits on a vine that's gotten sick? Climate change, I've had climate change every year for 60 years. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, what were this like, we had more rain and then when I, before I, I did my vineyards in Santa Barbara County, I looked at the history of Santa Barbara County. Floods, fire, and drought. That was the history of our county. And it pretty much hasn't changed that much. We finally got some rain, as you know, uh, but uh, we have to adjust to the climate. Just like right now, I'm having a problem with cool weather during the flowering. So you do want to put on any, any irrigation water. You've got to be careful of spraying. And the, 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 you're asking about fungus? I've been farming for 50 years, and it's never been an issue. And what we do is, uh, mildew is our biggest culprit. And then, of course, there's other things that could happen. But what we do is we have to spray for mildew. In the old-fashioned way, you use copper and sulfur. It's called the Bordeaux mix. And what we try to do, I don't like vineyard sulfur in my wine. So what I do is I do it up till bloom time. And once they bloom and set the new berries, I stop that. And there's some new products out that are supposed to be harmless. And that uh, we're using uh, one called Quintec that I like, that uh, you, you spray on every 20 days and it controls things pretty good. I have found that a healthy plant, a healthy plant will help you on all, all these occasions. Just like we have right now, we have the mealy bug and he'll destroy your vineyard. And, and if you get it and don't spray, goodbye vineyard. And some of the sprays out there are not so good and there's some that you, can, you could get by with but what I learned, and I, I got, it was confirmed when I went to Europe eight years ago, it cost me $146 an acre to buy the pheromone uh, clips. I buy these clips, and I put one every five vines. It cost me $146 an acre, and we put a clip every five vines, and I get about an 80 to 90% control of the mealybug. The other thing is I teach our workers to go through the vineyard and do all this stuff on these vines. I teach them what, what it is and what they see. And if we, we find a vine with mealybug, we mark it, we tag it. And if it's just one or two vines, we might go in and spray those individual vines. Or the other thing we do if we're harvesting and we see it, we, get a, we have plastic bags, we pick the fruit in plastic bags and it goes to the dump. We don't, uh, and, we, and we've been able to control the medium. I just had a neighbor who went organic, and in three years, his vineyard is gone. It's gone. There was no controls. And he, he should have gone to the, to the clips. When I was in Bordeaux doing, doing a deal, and the guy said, what do they say in front of me? He says, does anybody know what this clip is for? <laughs> I said, well, I think I do, because I, I use it myself, you know. But, uh, but there, you know, I made a statement about, uh, today we, I, ca I call them gourmet pesticides. I mean, you can buy pesticide made out of cinnamon. I mean, there's some stuff out there that are, that are really interesting to, to help control things. Yes? Uh, there's a winery here in Indiana, Oliver Winery, and there are some interesting wines that are putting out. You haven't said anything about fruits or vegetables combined to make a wine. The one that seemed strangest to me but turned out to be delicious was their cucumber wine. Well, uh, only I can tell you this. There's a wine maker, a lady winemaker named Lane Tanner. And she's from Santa Barbara County and she's the first and most important lady winemaker in the history of Santa Barbara County. Because she was there, not only there first, but she did some outstanding things. She just made a ginger wine 
She made from grapes with ginger, and it got a 92 in Wine Enthusiast magazine. And I had it, and I'll tell you what, there's something good about it. I mean, it's good. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Uh, my name, my name is Louis Lucas, and the simple thing to do, and it's very simple, is llwine.com, and that, that'll get you right there. I think that's a great place to end the question and answer session. We're, we're, if you've got more questions, please, please come up. One more question. One more question. When are we going to get to the Cabernet? <laughs> hey, it's, so we have Jed Heckel from Notre Dame Family Wines, and she'll say a few words. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Jed Heckel. Um, I work. I'm the director of marketing with Experience Notre Dame, and we are part of the the part of a team that brings together Notre Dame Family Wines. So there's a slide behind me. I uh, invite you to use the QR code and learn a little more about it. Um, we are really appreciative of Louis being here, the College of Science, Notre Dame Alumni Association. This is a great collaboration and a way for us to get Notre Dame Family Wines in front of the, our audience and the people that we want to really embrace this program. The program is about engagement. It's about sharing wines and it's about bringing a piece of Notre Dame that you can share and enjoy with your friends and family when you aren't able to be here on campus. To be part of the program, the vendors and the wineries all have a connection to Notre Dame. So you can read about their stories here. Every year we select new wines. There's a club membership to be part of. And we design beautiful labels that look lovely on every bar cart. No bias. Um, so every year we design a new theme. So the labels for next year won't look like this. And it's a collaboration with a group on campus, and I can't share anymore. So please join the newsletter, and you'll see the new collaboration, the new set of wines that will be coming out for next year. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you, Jen. So we're out of time, but I, I think you'll agree with me. This is one of the best active learning experiences you've had. Um, I want, to, I want to thank again Notre Dame Family Wines. Um, and if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on Think ND for a family of programming around the science and business of wine, spirits, and beer. And so this is going to include special programming, such as Wine Behind the Curtain with Professor Joe Sweeney from Mendoza, The Secret Life of Spirits, which I'm also co-organizing, the People's Brew with Alex over here, who is our resident beer expert. And then please check us out on think.nd.edu and please register to participate. There's a giveaway. Guys, there's a giveaway. And that includes Notre Dame Family Wines Wine Carrier, two Notre Dame Family Wines Bottle Stoppers, for example, like this. Uh, one night at the Morris Inn, Notre Dame. One dinner for two at Roars at Morrison. Think ND embossed hardcover notebook and pen. A set of Notre Dame coasters and more. So again, I thank you and uh, thank you for coming and joining us today.